Good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful Saturday morning on the shores of the Patuxent River in Baltimore. The uh, Patuxent flows into Chesapeake Bay, and uh, we're in the Port Covington neighborhood of Baltimore at the Sagamore Spirit Distillery this morning for a special Saturday morning episode of Whiskey Cast Live. Uh, it is Penny's Proof Day here at Sagamore Spirit, and uh, I am joined right now. We'll, well, let me just explain what we're going to do first. We're going to be here for the next hour, hour and a half or so. We'll talk with some folks from Sagamore Spirit. We'll find out about some of the challenges of building an urban distillery in what was previously a very industrial and rundown neighborhood. And we'll uh, talk about Penny's Proof, which is... Uh, Whiskey that's actually distilled behind me in the uh, Sagamore Spirit Distillery. I'm sitting in front of the visitor center. The distillery is behind me. And it's uh, rye whiskey made here in Baltimore. And Maryland rye has a very unique heritage. We'll get into some of that as well. But uh, right now, I want to bring in my first guest. Uh, Brian Tracy is the president of Sagamore Spirit. And good morning, Brian. How are you this morning? Wonderful. Thank you very much for being here. And you are properly caffeinated, as am I. <laughs> I see it is uh, way too early for both of us to be up this morning. Yeah, well, it's. It, I actually I got up even earlier than I anticipated because I just so much excitement today for Penny's Proof, our second one, our second release. So this is just an exciting time for the Sagamore family. Explain what Penny's Proof is. Yeah, uh, so our column still that makes our whiskey behind us was named by our Whiskey Thieves fan club. They named her Penny. And a lot of folks, you know, we started contract distilling at MGP and are anxiously waiting when um, we will release our Maryland made whiskey. And so what we've decided to do is kind of bring people into the process of aging, let them understand why we wait the time we frame we wait. And so last year we released our first release, which was, um, it's a three pack of two uh three 200 milliliter uh samples of our whiskey and last year we did a two and a half year old and this year we're doing a three and a half year old and we call those that three pack sip share and savor and so you can sip one now share one with a friend and savor and compare and follow along with us in the journey of aging and maturation and you can understand and see that our whiskey is making great progress but you can also see maybe why it's not quite in the bottle yet and so to do that, we also then turn around, name it Penny's Proof as, as proof of, of the good whiskey coming off a of penny, and then we sell it to you for one penny. And let's explain that because you really mean one penny. You've one got a penny. jar out there. Uh, you can't see behind us. It's actually a little ways down the road on the other side because when I drove up here at 6.15 this morning, there was a line of cars, maybe 100 cars in line, and you've only got about 600 bottles of uh, packages of this, 594 to be exact. Correct. But as they're driving through, because we are doing this socially distanced and we are sitting at least six feet apart, which is why I'm not wearing a mask and sitting outside today. And since you've got to be in contact with a whole bunch of people, you are for safety. But explain how this is going to work today. Yeah. So it is a first come, first serve. And you do have to be a member of our Whiskey Thieves, which 
is no cost. You just go to our website and sign up to be a whiskey thief. And, and you know, the, the pros of being a whiskey thief is you get to know about special releases or events before anybody else. Or we have some events that are just for you, like Penny's Proof. And so you sign up to be a whiskey thief. Uh, it's first come, first serve. Uh, you wait in line in your car. Last year, we had them stand outside the distillery. This year, we're having everybody stay in their car. And it'll be a curbside, basically, pickup event. And if they wanted to order some of any other whiskeys, you know, that we have available in the, the visitor center or merchandise, they can do so online and we'll just package it all together and, and hand it off to them in a social distant manner. And you've also got, uh, this is really sort of, this would have been a bigger, much bigger event had it not been for COVID because uh, we've got the uh, Rye Street uh, Tavern behind you in this shot and they would have had live music going here, say around 10 o'clock or so. And uh, this would have been a big party all day long, right? Yeah, we would have. We would have promoted it and, and gotten as many people down here as humanly possible and, and celebrated it all day. But, you know, given COVID, I think we're we're doing the, the best thing we can do in a responsible manner. We wanted to move forward with the event. Um, and I think as long as everyone does curbside, stays in their car, we're all wearing masks and so forth. Um, we obviously have plenty of hand sanitizer as well. <laughs> and so uh, it should be a very safe event. And, uh, and you know, given COVID, I think some people need something like this in some ways, you know, as long as it can be done properly. And let's talk about the hand sanitizer because you guys are back to making whiskey now, but you were making hand sanitizer for a few months here, right? We were, um, you know, like many folks in mid-March, you know, I, I heard the, the rumblings of, of COVID. I didn't fully understand it uh, at the time, you know, but uh, we certainly wanted to respect it. And we, we shut down on March 15th. We got a phone call from some local hospitals, one particular one, Johns Hopkins, and said, do you guys know how to make hand sanitizer? And we said, no, that's not something we do. We don't know how to do that. And they said, well, would you think about it? And I said, sure. And they call us back the next day. And I said, I talked it over. It, it, our stills aren't necessarily something that are designed to, to get to that high proof that we that we that we know of. And so we're not sure we can do it. And then they basically gave a very grim picture saying, you know, we've been working with um, the hospitals in Washington State, which already had experience with this. They're going to say you're going to go through four to ten times the amount of hand sanitizer you normally do starting in about a week. And the supply chain is completely eroded and there's no hand sanitizer available on the market. And there isn't going to be any anytime soon. Would you please figure it out? And so we called Larry Ebersold, who helped us with the process design of the, the plant, is still very much involved with the project and really just a legendary guy, an incredibly knowledgeable guy. And he'll be joining us here in a few minutes. He'll be joining us in a few minutes. And he, he basically said, you know, I think we can get you there. We talked about slowing down the feed and, and the rate which we put through. And, and sure enough, we got there. And then we worked closely with the pharmacist team at Johns Hopkins to develop something that was, you know, get FDA and met the World Health Organization standards and 80% ABV. And uh, we got a beautiful hand sanitizer. And so we ended up supplying to about 160 different organizations throughout our community here, uh, probably 10, 11 different hospitals uh 60,000 liters and we made hand, sanit hand sanitizer through July we still have plenty here as well so <laughs> and you sell it in the gift shop too by the gallon jug right we do we got all shapes and sizes in there and that's part of the way that the distilling community nationwide has really helped step up here because practically almost every small scale distillery did this in some way right I don't know of a single one that really didn't. It's amazing, you know, the, how many of them rallied to do this. And, and so many of them just sold it for a cost or gave it away. And, you know, the, these distilleries right now are really with the tasting rooms kind of closed or, or very limited capacity. I mean, it's, it's a really speaks volumes about this community of distillers and what they've done. And, you know, staring down the barrel of, of a potential 400% tax increase with the FET um, uh, reduction potentially going away at the end of the year. So, Certainly challenging times, but you know everyone rolled up their sleeves and said, we got to do this, and it's, it's an amazing community. We are less than a month away from that FET extension deadline. December 11th is when Congress has to get a spending bill passed or the government shuts down. December 18th is when they go home for the end of the session because we start with a whole new Congress next year after the first of the year. What's your big fear in the distilling community if this doesn't get approved? Oh, 
uh, I think there's a lot of distilleries that have never actually paid the 1350 a gallon versus the 270. And again, you know, this is just parity with beer and wine. We're not asking for any special treatment. Um, the there's so much uncertainty still with COVID and and, and the economy and small distilleries. They're not going to be hiring. Um, they're probably going to stop working with local agricultural communities because you do pay a little bit more for local grains. Um, and that it could lead to some closing their doors. What would it do to you guys here? It would drastically affect, um, I think, our hiring. We probably wouldn't do any hiring at all next year. Uh, we'd love to do some hiring, but we're, we're not doing it until we better understand that. Uh, and it would probably affect um, any type of market expansion. And, you know, we've started a really great local agricultural um, uh, with local grains and local farmers, and that would probably be, end up having to be capped. And it's instructive here because Sagamore Spirit is relatively well healed compared to most small scale distillers. You have the backing that you need to be able to do this. So you could do it, but you don't have to. You could still fund this if you needed to, theoretically. But it doesn't make sense economically if you're paying the full 1350, right? That's right. And I mean, we are fortunate, but at the same time, we have to run it like a business. We have to make smart decisions. Um, you know, and you have to make decisions that make you a profitable company at some point. You know, we're still new. And we're fighting to get there. And so those hurdles will just kind of set things back. How many states are you guys in? And let's talk about that distribution angle. How many states are you in now? And where do you hope to get to, assuming FET reform gets approved? You know, currently we're in 38 states and six countries. Um, Honestly, I don't know how many more states we would take on next year, but we would like to go deeper into our markets. What really drives the expansion we've had is we're fortunate enough to start working with national counts. You know, the, the Landry's of the world, the Masher Steakhouses, um, the Ruth Chris, um, love to work with Morton's and, and, you know, you start working with the AVPs and, and, you know, hopefully Kroger and those things, which are great for distribution and sales, um, kind of dictate where you need to be. So if they say, well, we take you on, but you're not in the state. We'll certainly go open up that state. Um, so it's hard to say right now how many states we would open up next year. We're we're in a lot of great states, um, but we the money you need to hire salespeople to go deeper and penetrate into that market and grab market share uh, it, it helps get funded through programs like this tax reduction. We are sitting in the Port Covington neighborhood on the shores of the Patuxent River. It's fair to say that. Uh, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have come down here on a Saturday morning for anything, right? <laughs> yeah, very safe to say that. You know, there was there was nothing here 10 years ago. This was uh, just, you know, brown space. And so, it's, but it's got such a rich history of, of rail cars and bringing in coal from, you know, Western Maryland and West Virginia. Um, and I think that's the cool thing about the, the, the distilling industry. They revitalize a lot of these old neighborhoods and old warehouses other people probably don't see value in um, but are ideal for our type of businesses so and then they obviously we create jobs so um yeah this is a great space i mean we're right here on the waterfront how many waterfront distilleries are there in the u.s this is a spectacular spot and i'm showing an aerial photo right now from looking out from over the river and showing the baltimore skyline in the background that's interstate 95 in the middle there and like a lot of east coast cities interstate 95 really cut this neighborhood off didn't it it did it's amazing. Just on the other side of that highway is the Inner Harbor, which everyone knows. That's where the aquarium is. That's where our museums are, all the restaurants. And so we really did put ourselves, we'll say on a peninsula, but on an island in a sense over here. But, you know, it's a great anchor and it's a start of the, this project and they're going to build more and more around us. Uh, so it's going to be a thriving area in, in, you know, another five, 10 years. Your boss, Kevin Plank, the uh, founder of Under Armour and uh, the Brain, brainchild behind uh, Plank Industries, which owns Sagamore Spirit, really was instrumental in creating this Port Covington campus, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's an absolute visionary, great entrepreneur, um, loves the city of Baltimore, as do we. It's a great city and, you know, uh, really wants to see another reason for people to come visit this great city and discover it. There's so much going on here, so many great things. And, you know, we're just another part that just adds another reason to come see us. And uh, his, he's a great visionary, so we're lucky to have him behind us. You lost a lot of tourist traffic this year, right? Yeah. Because of the pandemic, uh, yeah. because of the location here. And you guys were doing uh, whiskey on the waterfront concerts 
during the summer and things like that last year that you couldn't do this year. What did that have as an impact on you? Oh, I mean, it's, it's drastically affected revenue as far as in our visitation. You know, for us too, this, this is our greatest recruiting tool we have, our distillery, right? It's a greatest chance for us to come in and share our story and, and really help build the brand. Um, so, you know, when we look at foot traffic being down about 88% on the year, that's a huge blow as far as getting people in and, and experiencing Sagamore's hospitality. Well, we're getting some comments coming in from people who are in the line oh. or near the line. So <laughs> I hope you have your radio handy because- I turned uh, it off, but- you might want to turn it back on because we've got some people with complaints. So let's see here. Um, we are Dean Albin. We are at the city garage in a conga line. Where is the end? Is anyone counting cars? Um, Allison Laurel, we got pushed to the city garage when we were on the correct street. The city uh, the security guard didn't make all cars turn around over here. And there's other folks saying they're behind the city garage and worried that security won't pull us back too. Um, I'm going to let you go so you can go take care of that. Yeah, uh, I think we do have people, uh, you know, checking and counting and trying to stay in communication with the best they can. But we'll certainly get out there and do our best. We appreciate everybody being patient. Um, you know, this is uh, a new tactic for us this year. We, yeah. Like I said, we want to move forward. Um, COVID's had its challenges and we're trying to do our, the best we can. You know, it probably won't be perfect at the end of the day and we apologize, but we'll, we'll do everything we can to make it right. Uh, I think Gumby rules apply this year. We got to be flexible <laughs> on everything. And uh, Brian Tracy, thank you for your time. Um, we'll probably talk to you a little bit later on this morning, but I want to let you go deal with that. And I don't mean to hammer you with that this early in the morning, but uh, since we are broadcasting this live and uh, the word did go out to the whiskey thieves that were coming to this, that they could listen on our Facebook page. So we have a bunch of folks listening in their cars awesome. and filing comments. So, and uh, Carly Kirby, we love you, BT. <laughs> Thank you, Carly. <laughs> oh, that's Carly back over there. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, just behind the cameras there. So, um, Brian, we'll talk to you in a little yeah. bit here because I want to bring in Larry Ebersold now, your distilling consultant and uh, one of the best in the business. Larry, can you hear me okay? I can, Mark. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? I'm just hunky-dory. <laughs> you are in uh, Lawrenceburg, right? I actually live in Hebron, which is northern Kentucky. Okay, so you are still a Kentucky distiller then, right? Uh, yes, sir, I am. So let's uh, talk about your connection to Sagamore Spirit. Uh, you made some of their original spirit back in the LDI MGP days, right, when you were still the master distiller there, right? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, I did. And then you wound up, after you retired, you wound up working with uh, the Sagamore folks as a consultant. Uh, yes, I did. I was introduced to Sagamore through a friend of mine that uh, worked with me at Seagram's by the name of Jim Moorhead. And uh, he introduced me to him and they, Jim was still working at the time he was working for Jim Beam. Uh, that was after, of course, the split up of the company, Seagram's. And so I began uh, working with him and met uh, Brian. He came on board shortly after I uh, made my first visit to uh, Baltimore. And we um, kind of hit it off together. Uh, at least I think so. You have to ask Brian for sure. But we uh, began plans for the new distillery. Well, we let Brian go to go deal with some traffic issues in the uh, Penny's Proof line. Tell me about sort of the history of Maryland rye. I know you have done rye whiskeys for years and years and years, but uh, making a Maryland rye sort of has a unique connection, doesn't it? Well, to be honest with you, Mark, I, I really don't know that much about Maryland rye. Okay. I, I, I do know that uh, it must contain mostly rye grain. And of course, their recipes fit that perfectly, as did most of the rye that I made, to be honest with you. What makes rye whiskey so different from other whiskeys? During our webcast last night from here, we were talking with Colin Scott, the uh, master blender for Chivas Brothers. And one of the things that a listener pointed out was that rye whiskey is sort of almost the unique American whiskey because in, in much the way that Scotch whiskey is unique to Scotland, rye whisk whiskey really is 
a un, almost a uniquely American spirit. Now, rye whiskey, of course, is made in Canada, in Europe, and all over, but the concept of rye whiskey is really an American phenomenon, right? Well, when the uh, people came over from Europe and to Pennsylvania area, they brought with them the grain that they had, which was the rye, and began planting it. And of course, as things evolved, rye whiskey was one of the first whiskeys that were made in the U.S. And it wasn't until later that the corn whiskey, uh, or corn whiskey and bourbon became popular. But the rye whiskey contains a very unique characteristic in being spicy. Uh, that part of it is what I really enjoy personally. And depending on how it's cooked, uh, the more spice will come through than other times. And I know the recipes that are being used in the process that they use to cook the rye in Sagamore, which follows the procedures that I used at Seagram's, brings out that spiciness uh, better than those that cook with corn, of course, and those that uh, cook uh, at a higher temperature. And it's that spicy character that blends well, and that's one of the reasons that we made so much of it at, at Seagram's because of Seagram's Seven Crown. They needed that for blending, and it was that spicy character that they really enjoyed and, in fact, tried to make it in several different locations. We were the most successful in Indiana. Rye is a bear to distill, isn't it? Uh, well, it, it's gotten easier over the years with the introduction of new enzymes, but when um, I was doing rye whiskeys back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, some of those enzymes that help out greatly now didn't exist. And one of the classics of rye is it's nice and sticky, and it also has um, characteristics that make it foam. And in Indiana, we had wooden fermenters. And the uh, fermenters, we would set them so that we had four feet of nothing in there. So the top of the fermenters went down four feet before you got to the liquid surface. And it was not uncommon for, at a certain stage early uh, in the fermentation, say at about 20 hours, 24 hours to 28 hours, they would begin to foam. and to everyone's surprise, they would foam to the top of the fermenters and over the sides. Now, I know that uh, Sagamore has experienced this on occasion, and it uh, makes a mess, for one. You lose a little bit, of course. And then when you try to get to uh, run it through the drying operation, which we had a rather large one in Indiana, uh, it, it's nice and sticky. Sticks the equipment, gets the equipment dirty quicker, and that's where it really comes into being a bear to run. Uh, everything gets dirty faster when you run rye whiskey. I know our friend, the uh, late, great Dave Pickerel, used to refer to rye as the brat of grains. Yeah, very much so. Tell us about this distillery that's behind me here, because you helped in the design of it and layout. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful facility for anyone who has never seen it. Uh, it, it was a real challenge to put together. Uh, they have something unique that most, in fact, I don't know of anyone who has two doublers. So that was a new experience for me as well as um, everybody that was on the team. Let's explain what a doubler is, first of all, for those who are more familiar with pot still distillation. Uh, if after the column still, the alcohol coming off of the beer still, as we refer to it, goes into the doubler, which is a process of simply reboiling the alcohol. And it, it has a tendency to make it just a little bit lighter, a little bit cleaner, as, as we refer to it. And the bottom of the doubler is actually recirculated back to the beer well so we get another pass at it. And all it does is gives it a bump and proof. Now it doesn't go up double, uh, but it, it will raise the proof anywhere from five to 10 proof higher. In the process with uh, Sagamore, we do that twice. So it's, uh, it was a little bit of a challenge to start it, but it uh, seems to work very, very well. So but explain the, where it raises the proof too on, when you run it through a doubler twice. 
Well, it's uh, every time that you have, so where, where does it come off at the column still? It comes off the the, the column still to approximately 125 to 128 proof. And the first doubler will, will bring it up to maybe 100, 132 proof, and then they bump it up to about 135 proof. And every time that you reboil alcohol, the uh, proof will increase. A little bit of water stays behind, and that's part of what goes back into the beer well. And so that's how that's how it bumps up because of the volatility of alcohol over water. So tell me how the stuff that they're distilling here tastes compared to what you were making for them in Indiana. You have to keep in mind that every distill, distillery has its own unique characteristics. And the characteristics that were in Indiana were of course the very the the spiciness the the clove characteristic that comes through in Sagamore the characteristics are very very similar now they're using a very similar way of cooking and the distillation of course is almost identical the flora and fauna as I call it uh, is developed over time and Sagamore has developed a very nice flora and fauna if you will and uh, I just tasted the uh, three and a half year old, and it's looking extremely nice. It's coming along as we had hoped. And I get samples periodically from Sagamore. They're always curious of what I think about it. And uh, so I've followed it, and it's, it's doing a great job. And I think in a, another year, it's going to be some really good rye whiskey. I think everybody will be pleased with it. Well, Larry, I want to thank you for your time getting up early on a Saturday morning in uh, Hebron, Kentucky to uh, join us. Uh, thanks again for everything you've done for distilling over the years. Uh, you've made some great whiskeys over the years, and we really appreciate all of your contributions to the industry. Thank you, Mark. All right. We'll let, talk to Larry a little bit later on here. Now, I'm getting some messages coming in from folks who are frustrated and uh, worried about line movements. And we are checking on that, but there is starting to get some movement in line. I got to give you an update, just to sort of explain here, and I don't have the graphic to show you. And uh, we weren't quite able to get the video set up to uh, show you how this is being run, but the line is about uh, maybe a quarter mile or so down the road at check-in. And then they're routing everyone through a series of stations around the uh, Port Covington complex to keep basically to keep everybody in their cars and socially distanced uh, there's some hot chocolate along the way but there is a lot of road construction around here um, this whole neighborhood is being redeveloped Sagamore was really the first part of the Port Covington development so there is a lot of construction going on around here um, my best advice is just to be patient and be flexible I know that uh, some folks have said that there are uh, there are people worried about not being handled fairly or being turned away because they're losing their place in line. And I got to be honest, I have no control over that. Uh, I'm here as a guest of Sagamore Spirit to do the webcast, but uh, we are in communication with their folks and we'll try to get you an update in uh, just a few minutes here. But uh, in the meantime, let's see if I can actually make this work. Well, that didn't work, but I'm here with Ryan Norwood, who is the operations director at Sagamore Spirit. And uh, we're also being joined right now, just as uh, perfect timing. Perfect timing, Corin, how are you? Corin Wheatley is the lab manager. Let me turn the microphones on here. Lab manager for Sagamore Spirit. And we have some whiskey glasses. So we're actually going to uh, taste the new Penny's Proof. So tell me about this whiskey and I'll leave whichever one of you wants to go ahead and go ahead and do it. I'll start doing it. Uh, Mark, thanks for having us. Uh, super excited to actually get this whiskey out in front of people. You know, this is, uh, as Larry was kind of saying, this is our kind of, uh, this is our first run at it. You know, this is whiskey that we first started producing when we opened up the building in early uh, 2017. And so it's exciting to us. This is our mash, two mash bills. So this is our high rye mash bill that's at 95% rye, 5% malted barley. And then our low rye mash bill that's at 52% rye, 5% malted barley, and 43% corn. So we, we cook these, we ferment them and distill them and age them completely separately. 
And then on the back end, we blend them into a flavor profile that we feel does a good representation of that Maryland style rye, that rye that's that's not quite as spicy as some of those Pennsylvania ryes or even New York ryes and, and is a little bit more approachable. And and so this is this is it at three and a half years. Uh, it's that blend of the two. Um, we feel like it's really heading in the right direction. It's not exactly where you know we see it in a year from now, but that's part of our process is pushing for a four-year-old whiskey. And uh, so, yeah, if you want to taste through it. Absolutely. Corinne, tell me about Maryland Rye. What makes it unique? So, uh, and let's have you pull that microphone if you want to just move it in a little bit closer here. Oh, Sorry see. about that. Live television, gang. Nothing quite <laughs> like it. Uh, so Maryland rye is generally unique from other types of rye that we do have those two different mash bills. So it's not quite the in-your-face rye like you would if you had like that 95% or even 100%. And kind of having both of those mash bills in there gives it a little bit more of a gentler approach. So when you do go through and smell it, it's not all spice, all in your face. But it does have that sweetness underneath that it really feels like kind of makes it that Maryland rye. I know a lot of folks like to complain about getting a dill note in their ryes, and a lot of folks will say that dill is really a fault if you get it in your rye. Others like it, and it's one of those things. It's a six of one half, a dozen of the other. Where do you where do you where do you two come down on this? Uh, the dill is an interesting one for me because there there's definitely rye I've I've tasted that in. You know, obviously one of the things I always say when we're when we're tasting whiskey is like no palate's the same. So like your perception of, of whiskey is completely different than mine. And so it's, it's always interesting to, to get people's perceptions. And that's one thing when I, whenever I taste people on whiskey is, is I try to allow them to tell me what they're tasting and, and perceiving, because I never want to plant that seed. And sometimes I'll do it on accident where it's like, Oh, do you get that spice? Do you get that cinnamon? And they're like, Oh, that's all I taste is cinnamon. <laughs> it's like, I get it. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, uh, you know, there are some rides that I do taste it in. Um, you know, I, I, I have tasted in, in MGP rise, but uh, to me, yeah, I like I said, it's it's there's some it's in there, and then there's others where I don't I don't get it as much. How much do you get, Corin? I personally don't get too much dill. I think uh, I'm not getting any on this, yeah. no. right? But in some some rise, you do though. In some, you do like get just a little bit of a hint, but I don't get as much on ours personally. The aroma on this, I'm getting those nice dry baking spices that you're supposed to get with a rye. Yeah, for sure. Along with a little bit of honey, a little bit of vanilla. Honey, vanilla. I get a lot of caramel on ours, personally. Yeah, and Mark, and that's one of the fun things about doing this, too, is, is as we're going through and tasting these, is you actually see the incredible difference from barrel to barrel, you know, like, and, and some of those caramel, vanilla flavors that'll actually stand out from just a barrel to barrel is, is awesome. And and you know, and, and this one I'm actually really happy with because sometimes when they're younger, they, they have that kind of green flavor, but they also can be very woody where they've taken on a lot of those wood wood flavors mm -hmm. from the oak. Uh, and, and over time those are mellow out. And so I'm really happy with this one where you, it's there, but it's not like, it's not the number one flavor that you get, you know? Now I did not get the chance to taste last year's version. How does this compare to last year's? I'll let Corinne speak to that. <laughs> okay. So uh, compared to last year, I think that year really did it some favors the two and a half year does have some of those greener notes but i mean it's i think it's important to note like when we put it out we were so proud of it because it was our first product to be like look this is what we've done and it's important to keep in mind it was a two and a half year and so i think it does still have a lot of the same flavors it's just so much more cohesive and rich and they blend together so well this go around like the caramels are richer the vanilla is more pronounced it's not as artificial smelling is what i get a lot in younger whiskeys is that kind of artificial vanilla right i'm getting more like ground vanilla beans things yeah. like that uh, a little bit of dried cinnamon spice like cinnamon bark almost yeah. mm -hmm. and uh mark it's a tough comparison to make the the two and a half to three three and a half year old because that year does it does amazing yeah. things in it but uh you know, it's and that's part of why we did this was we we offer everybody three bottles and we call it sip sip, sip saver share. So uh, one is to is to hold on to 
to taste later. And, and hopefully people saved a bottle from last year and they can actually do that side by side comparison and see those differences and, and how it's evolved. And then, and then when we release a product next year, they'll be able to compare all three of them and say, wow, like it, I can actually see the progression of this over time. So it's, it is the same batch that we blended up for last year. So we used uh, the same, roughly the same barrels and with all within that same batch. So it should be a pretty good comparison. So you are going to release it next year. Well, We'll release something next year. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't want you to get ahead of, of uh, Brian and the marketing no, no, folks never, on that never. one. But, uh, you know how it is when you're talking to production. It's like, <laughs> you know, we're, we're happy with what we're making and, and, and we'll drive it the best we can. So, But that brings up a great question. Who decides when it's ready? Uh, you guys who are making it, the marketing guys, Brian, Brian's boss, the big guy, who makes the final call and when it's ready? Depends on who you ask. Uh, I would say I'd say it's a team decision for us. You know, it has to make sense. It has to be the best whiskey we can put out. And, you know, I, I think if you asked our sales folks, they want, they want us to release it right now. Um, it would give them that leverage to talk about the, the whiskey that we're making. But uh, I think I think it'll be a team decision. It'll be something we sit around and say, is this a better whiskey? Is this the best we can put out? And if it is, then then it'll be out there. Nothing quite like drinking fresh whiskey at <laughs> eight thirty in the morning. <laughs> I, like. I love the taste on this one. Um, it's great, spicy, no dill, well balanced. I mean, yeah, the sales guys have a point. You could release this now. Careful, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, I mean, other distilleries, there are some distilleries who release it three years yeah. in a day. Yeah. This is three and a half. And while I've seen a lot of distilleries that do really good stuff that wait four and a half to five years, this is something you could release fairly soon if you wanted to. I mean, it's got the quality to do it and it would hold up against the competition. And, that, and that's what we're excited about. And that's why, you know, uh, we're happy that those that first year that we were be able, able to make some good whiskey because, you know, as you're starting up a new facility, it's like you, there's you're running through a lot of issues, startup issues, trying to understand how the equipment works and and, you know, working with the grain providers, you know, in the beginning, there was there was trucks of grain that came in that we weren't that happy with. And, and that's a challenge to us to say, you know, this is the grain is such an important part of making whiskey. And we we were very strict with our quality control. But at the same time, there's things that slip by and, and we were all learning as we kind of progressed. But, you know, you never want to be that distillery that'll take that grain, you know, oh, send it to Sagamore, they'll take it. So we were really strict on it. And I think we were really happy with with really putting in those quality parameters early on. And that's when you have them send it to the ethanol plant down <laughs> exactly, the road, right? Exactly. <laughs> or the local farmer to feed to his, his cattle. So what are you looking for? Corin, when you're looking at grain? Because I assume your team is checking all the grain as it comes in, right? Right. So generally what we're looking for when we bring in grain is that we pull samples with the long grain sampler from the top, and we also pull samples from the bottom because a lot of those things settle down. So we'll go through and we'll pull the samples out. We run the moisture meter, so you don't want it to be too wet because then that could potentially lead to some mustier grain down the road as it goes through and affects the grain and then we take it and we heat it up and we smell it because that'll give you the best idea of what the grain is going to produce. Because if you heat it up and you do start to get some of those off notes and it's um, like jasmine and things like that. Yeah. So you get some of those notes or you like do like get kind of a must or like an off flavor or it just doesn't have the brightness to it that you're really looking for in the grain is what we go through and we look at and we keep samples from every truck that comes through just in case we do have issues we can kind of look back and see maybe where if that's where it came from or where it didn't come from so i mean just going and eyeing the grain seeing kind of like the different pieces that come in that aren't what we're looking for so we have a question for you corin from tabitha spirit bomb in england what does a spirit lab manager do? She's never heard of that <laughs> job role before. Um, pretty much every distillery has one, but they don't get to headlines and they don't get interviewed very often. Yeah, I can't say this is exactly my comfort zone. <laughs> I do hide in the lab on purpose. <laughs> but um, so what I do is pretty much just quality assurance. I do quality checks on the whole process, all from grain fermentation, distillation to the aging barn. So I pull fermentation samples every day from all the tanks that we have, making sure the pH and the alcohol and everything is looking the way that it's supposed to be looking um, as it goes through. And the distillation process, I smell and taste all of the distillate samples 
from all three steps of our distillation process, making sure they're looking and tasting the way that they're supposed to. I um, manage our sensory panel. So all the guys come through and I put out all the sensory um, samples for them and making sure that they're keeping up on that the way they're supposed to. So we do have that data to look back on in the future if we need it. Um, I go out to our aging barn and pull samples and check things out out there and making sure our whiskey finishing or cask age products are going along the way that they're supposed to. Pull samples every two years. So I have two year samples from every batch that we've ever done and make people go through and taste that. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of fun stuff, it's very hands on, a lot of tasting, <laughs> which is not bad. I'm not mad at that part. <laughs> Beats real work, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, I, I consider this real work. <laughs> But last night during our webcast, we had Colin Scott, the master blender from Chivas Brothers on. And one of the questions, we were talking for a bit about the testing that he puts his, he put his sensory panel at Chivas Brothers through. Mm -hmm. Talk about what you put your sensory panel through just to make sure that they're on their game. Um, so we do kind of bring in people as they onboard. And I go through each of our mash bills and taste them through that. I have done sensory training where I will spike samples with off flavors. I've pulled some grain scum out of a truck before and soaked it in vodka and made people smell it so that they know what that smells like to know what they're looking for. And a lot of it, what we do is comparing it to a standard. So we have our samples that come in and then I create a standard that's generally a mixture of positive samples that we have come through. And it's good to be able to have them compare it to that it's easier to pick out faults or things that aren't the same when you have something standard to compare it to. So I usually have all the guys go through and do that and just kind of make sure they do it, keep up with it. A lot of sensory training is consistency. So if you're not doing it that often, then you're not going to be able to have a good idea of what we're looking for. And Tabitha says, thanks for that answer because she's a business analyst and says that uh, she's obsessed with processes. How did you set up the process to keep this on a consistent basis day in, day out? Um, a lot of the process we set up is mostly trial and error <laughs> is going through and being like, oh, we should probably add something here or maybe we should add something here. It's like I recently want to say recently, but I've been more strict about putting into place that after we do a blend, I have to make sure at least three people taste it before it goes to the bottling line. And after it comes out of the bottling line and goes through all of their uh, nozzles and the pipes and tubes and their filter through there, we go and taste it again before it's actually going through the bottling line and getting packaged because we want to make sure everything's fine coming out of the blend. And then you want to make sure everything's fine going through all of those different tubes and the filter in there. For example, if anything's left over from the last batch, you want to make sure that doesn't come through again. So a lot of it is realizing where your spots are that you're missing and then going back and creating processes to fill those spots just to make sure you're where you need to be at it every point in time. I always love to ask folks how they got into the business. What's your background and how did you wind up here? <laughs> So uh, I've heard that my story is an interesting one from outsiders, but we'll so, be the judge. Of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up, uh, my parents were home brewers. So even as a kid, I was going through and corking bottles of wine and slapping on labels for things that we made at home. And my first job was at a homebrew store, packaging up all the bottle caps into Ziploc bags and he would pay me $5 a box for every box that I did. And so I went to school originally for psychology. And on my 21st birthday, my parents took me on a brewery tour and I went through and I saw the lab and I was like, that's what I want to do. So I changed my major to biochemistry and molecular biology. <laughs> and I graduated from UMBC with a bachelor's in biochemistry. And I was in the chemistry club and a guy came through and he did a presentation on the chemistry of beer and brewing. And I happened to be on a distillery tour here at Sagamore Spirit. And I saw that same guy, his name's Chris. 
and I was like, hey, I remember you from coming to do this presentation for our chemistry club. It was super interesting. I see now you're in distilling. Like, how's it going? Like, how's everything here? How's that transition? And they happened to be just in the beginning stages of hiring a lab tech at the time. And so I was just about to graduate and he's like, hey, here's my card, send me your resume. So it just happened to be right place, right time, exactly what I wanted to do with exactly the person who I knew. <laughs> That's how it always works. And that's kids. That's why you sign your kid up for chemistry club and make him actually go to the club meetings, guys, because uh, this stuff does lead to real jobs. Ryan, your story. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, basically, uh, my story was that I went to school for microbiology. Uh, my plan along uh, the way was actually to go to medical school. So I was pre-med and, and planning that. And uh, one of my freshman year seminars, it was something very similar to Corinne's, was that uh, we had somebody from New Belgium Brewing Company come in and they talked. I went to school in Fort Collins, Colorado, and she came in and talked about the lab. And she was just like, this is an opportunity within my microbiology. You know, there's a lot of yeast, there's microorganisms, there's a lot of biology and fermentation. And I was like, wow, that's so awesome. Now I'm going to do medicine. And then uh, about my junior year, uh, they sent out an email and it said the internship you've all been waiting for. And it said New Belgium's hiring an intern to come in and clean glassware, make media. I was like, oh, I'm pretty good at that stuff. I've been doing it for a while and I applied for it and I spent 10 years at New Belgium. Um, and by the end, we were, I was helping manage the yeast and fermentations. Uh, it was a quite a big operation at the time. And so then at that point, I I started looking for other jobs and, and was able to come out here and, and help Sagmore from the ground up, which was really exciting for me. So tell me about the yeast you use here is it a proprietary yeast like you'd see in kentucky are you using straight distiller's yeast what, yeah, we're using what are you using? A, yeah we're using a dry distiller's yeast uh it used to be called a red star yeast um it's from fermentus but it's uh now it's called usw6 uh and it's a it's a dry just kind of all-purpose distiller's yeast uh we do have a little rehydration tank so we rehydrate it for about 30 40 minutes before we put it in and uh, it's a workhorse it does a really great job we we start with uh adding it and in three days it takes it from zero percent alcohol to seven and a half percent um and ready to be run on the still so what's the game plan for pennies proof over time are you is it are you planning to release it and this decision may not have even been made yet although i suspect it probably has will it be blended in originally with stuff from mgp that you're getting or will it be bottled standalone or what's the plan for eventually replacing what you get from MGP with what you're making here? So there actually isn't a plan yet. And and I think a lot of us are kind of like anxiously waiting to see that, that path. But as I said to you before, I think one of the things we're interested in is does it make the best whiskey? And so, you know, if it, as we sit down and go through this and... I'm going to have you hold off a second <laughs> while the traffic helicopter goes over. Uh, presumably checking on the line for all news radio here in town just to see how long the line is because uh, this may be the uh, this may be the only traffic jam in Baltimore this morning and uh, the sun is now fully up and has come out from behind the clouds here so uh, this is going to get interesting as we go on but uh, let's go ahead and repeat that yeah Mark so uh, I I think yeah there hasn't been a decision made on on what we're doing I think as we go through and start to to see how how our whiskey ages and gets to that point at four years we'll we'll taste it alone. We will probably look at at some blends and does blending it into the MGP juice that we have does that make sense? Uh, does that make a better whiskey? And so that's still to be determined. But we are are just in that process. That'll be probably a lot of what Corinne will be doing over the next year is is trying to understand what that blend looks like, or or are we really comfortable and confident in our whiskey that we want to put it out alone? So, well, the, obviously the question comes to mind is that uh, do you try to keep the taste profile consistent with what you've had from MGP for the last several years that people have become ex used to from Sagamore Spirit or do you go in a whole different direction with the stuff that you're making is obviously that's got to be the decision here or at least come into play. Yeah, and I think and I think to, to Larry's point earlier was it's that flora and fauna, you know, that that's what makes us different. So naturally, it will be slightly different. You know, obviously, uh, the grain providers that we get grain from are slightly different. You know, all the raw materials that we're using are slightly different. So there will be these nuanced differences. Uh, but overall, it will it'll hopefully be somewhat similar. But our hope is, is with these smaller batches that we do, that there will be more flavor, there'll be more aroma that comes out of it. And, and that's what we're driving for. Well, I'm having fun this morning. This is uh, this is really interesting. And uh, one of the things that you guys have done to really do make Sagamore whiskeys interesting is a lot of the cask finishes. 
and you've done more than most distilleries with cask finishes. Tell me how you decide to, uh, which whiskeys you want to, which casks you want to use in doing your finishing. So part of that, Mark, was a, uh, when we first started, it was kind of, you know, we knew we had MGP juice. We were, we were blending that up. We were releasing that in our three products. And, and one of the things we started looking at was we actually started talking to some barrel brokers and, and, you know, they, they come with some pretty crazy, interesting, uh, casks at different times. And, and we started out, one of our first releases was a Muscatel finish. And, uh, part of that is, is we got a better understanding of the flavor profile of our whiskey and then a better understanding of what casks are out there and what we thought would be complementary flavors to the whiskey that we were producing. And, you know, when anytime you're doing any kind of finishing, it's it's a little bit of a gamble. It's a, I know these flavors, I understand those flavors. Will they work together? Will it produce the product that I'm looking for? And and we've been fortunate that some of them have produced some really great flavors. Uh, some we still have aging and sitting away. And, and it's fun for us because we never have an end product in mind per se. It's never like this is going to be released on this date. Uh, and we taste them. We're constantly tasting them uh, and going through and saying, is it progressing? Because sometimes you'll put it into a cask and, and you'll pick up some not so desirable flavors to begin, but those will mellow out over time and it'll start to pick up what you're actually looking for from that cask. And, and so you're just following this, this pattern that's almost like a wave and, and hoping to catch it at the perfect time and put it in the bottle and, and release a product that, that represents not only your whiskey and stays true to rye whiskey, but also takes on that flavor of the cask that you put it in. I want to bring Corin in you to talk about the red ale product because with your family's history in brewing <laughs> obviously you've got some experience with beer and this project that i believe was with sierra nevada mm -hmm. tell me about the red ale finish red ale finish so i think that all started out was due to the copyright infringement that we had with them or the battle over the yeah, hashtag yeah, yeah, or something yeah. and so it ended up being sort of like which hashtag was this? I don't remember this one. <laughs> which one was it? Uh, so basically, what happened was we we were doing uh, uh, Rye Day the thirteenth. Oh yeah, we were oh, talking cool. about all that stuff, and and one of the things was is we we actually when we looked it up, Sierra Nevada had done a beer that was like a, a Rye Day or or something along those lines, and yes, yeah, so when we reached out to him, it was, hey, we you're using this? Would you, would you be willing to to give this up for us? And Part of that discussion turned into us providing them, I think it was like 30 something barrels for them to age a beer in. And then I'll let you finish green. And then we ended up getting some of those barrels back. And so then we put whiskey back into them. So it was sort of like a layered finish of going back and forth and back and forth. And there's, man, I don't know, that one was a cool one. I yeah. liked working with Sierra and be able to put out the beer and then be able to follow it up with the whiskey almost a year later and kind of having the notes of the beer in it, but being able to taste them side by side and kind of finding that within the whiskey and just be able to pull it all out. Yeah, Mark. And one of the fun things about that was it was actually one of the true first, like true collaborations we did where we actually sent one of our distillers out to Chico and helped, we helped in the design of the beer and, and making up that recipe. And one of our distillers went out there and actually brewed the beer with them. Um, and then when we got those barrels back, it was a really fun project for us. And Sierra are, are, is a great company and a great team to work with. And, and we're really happy with the way that turned out. You're going to make more of it? To be determined. <laughs> no, no, there's nothing down right now. So, so Corinne, tell me what didn't work in a cask finish. What did you try? And you guys came back and said, oh, we are never doing this again. Everybody has one. <laughs> Honestly, I can't say that there's anything that we've put in a barrel where we've dumped. There's, I mean, not to name names, but there's some finishes that we had where we were not happy with them. So then we had to go back to marketing and be like, sorry, like we can't in good conscience release this right now. We're going to have to put it off. So then we rebarreled that particular product into our X rye barrels to be able to kind of bring it back down to where we wanted it to be. So we ended up with a product that we were happy with, but it started out with something that we were like, now we have 15 barrels of something that we don't know what we're going to do with if it doesn't work out. So you're unfinishing it essentially. <laughs> yeah. so we're gonna, we kind of like brought it back a little. So it like went too far and you bring it back and then it ended up with something I'm actually pretty happy with. This is sort of like that stubborn problem child that... <laughs> 
had to tame a little. <laughs> I've got to ask, uh, working out here in the middle of all this, you're away from the city, and it's almost like a park out here, except for all the cranes and the construction <laughs> and the barricades and all that. But uh, what's it like working out here? I mean, I think it's great. I live in the city. I love Baltimore City. And then to be able to come to work, still be technically in the city, but then have this view every morning, especially with daylight savings time. Now I come to work and the sun is rising behind these giant ships in the background. You can get up on top of all the silos and the silage tanks and be able to see the sunrise. And it's, I love it. It's beautiful. It's. <laughs> There's folks walking around back here, and uh, we, it's that's part of uh, live TV, guys. It's, it, it is what it is. We'll have fun with it. No, you're so what's next? after? What do you focus on for the next year? Is it getting Penny's Proof up to steam? Is it coming up with new innovations? What is it? It's a little bit of everything. I think from our standpoint, yeah, the, the main focus for 2021 is, is – understanding the, our, our product release and what that looks like and, and how that fits out there. Um, but then, yeah, then also, you know, anytime when you're dealing with whiskey, it's, it's hurry up and wait, you know, it's, it's a, Oh, what are we doing? You know, right now we're actually planning two, three, four years out for releases because you have to understand that like a lot of these are 18 month, two year aging processes post when we do the finishing of things. Um, and then also looking at, uh, different fun stuff. You know, we're, we're fortunate enough that we have a, a 250 gallon pot still in, in our distillery. So it's almost like a distillery within a distillery and, and it allows us the opportunity to do research and development and understand what, what different mash bills, different grains will produce. And it's an exciting opportunity for us to, to do some research and development and try to figure out what's next. But I think the, the big plan for 2021 is, is understanding our whiskey and, and how we want to get that out to market. Might we see a bottled in bond Sagamore spirit at some point soon? We might. We might. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely something we've talked about. Well, we have some good news now. We are starting to get people through the line. Yes. Uh, Stephanie got our number. Woohoo! <laughs> as she tweeted, as she pointed out on our Facebook page. Uh, Jen Tate, any update on numbers? They're still in the city garage parking lot. I don't have any word on numbers here. We'll try to get some updates if we can from the Sagamore spirit folks. Uh, be patient. Um, I'm hoping there aren't 600 people waiting in line and that everybody gets through this morning. We'll hopefully be able to get one. Once again, I have no control over that, but uh, we're hoping you can. And thanks for being patient and uh, waiting in line. Those of you who are sitting in your cars in the line out here on Cromwell Street and all the way out onto Hanover and uh, every place else in between in the parking garages and everything. Guys, I want to thank you for joining us uh, this morning and uh, taking some time. Ryan Norwood and uh, Curran Wheatley, the, uh, oops, I'm sorry here, our uh, operations manager, lab manager here at Sagamore Spirit. Thanks for spending some time with us. Um, well done on the whiskey. Um, I appreciate it in Slancha and uh, have a great day and enjoy the rest of this day. So Cheers. thanks, thank guys. Thank you, Mark. Very well. Thanks for having us. Once again, we are here at Sagamore Spirit Distillery in Baltimore. It is uh, just about nine o'clock. If you are just joining us, we are at, uh, doing a special version of Whiskey Cast live today, a live webcast, uh, talking about the release of Penny's Proof. This year's annual release is uh, still in the preview stage. It's a, a three and a half year old rye whiskey distilled on Penny, the uh, column still in the uh, distillery behind me here in Baltimore as we heard earlier during the webcast from Brian Tracy and Larry Ebersold, uh, Sagamore Spirits bottled whiskeys have all been distilled at MGP in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, uh, formerly Lawrenceburg Distillers, formerly the Seagram's Distillery. But uh, the whiskey from here is now three and a half years old and will eventually, probably this time next year, be working its way into bottles. And uh, there are 594 three packs of uh, Three 200 milliliter bottles, one to sip now, one to sip a little bit later, and then one to hang on to for uh, maybe next year if you were lucky enough to be here in line last year and got one of the two and a half year old releases and uh, be able to compare those and then hang on to them and compare them with the final product when it comes out uh, theoretically 
no decisions have been made, but theoretically a year or so from now, that should happen. And uh, for everybody who likes to complain about whiskey price increases and how, high, how much whiskey costs these days, those uh, three 200 milliliter bottles will cost you a pretty penny. One penny, in fact. Uh, that's why they're calling it pennies proof. Yes, this is a whiskey that loses a lot of money for Sagamore Spirit. But uh, as Brian Tracy told us last night on our uh, Friday Night Happy Hour webcast, uh, this one isn't designed to make money. It's designed to have fun. And uh, that's what they're doing here in uh, Sagamore Spirit in the heart of the Port Covington neighborhood of Baltimore. This really was the beginning of the Port Covington redevelopment project. As we pointed out earlier, Port Covington was a very industrial neighborhood for many, many years. It's right here on the Patuxent River, uh, part of, obviously, the port. There are docks here. Um, I can't really show it to you, but there are container ships uh, off to my uh, left shoulder here. And uh, it is part of a uh, massive redevelopment project that has been spearheaded by Kevin Plank, who owns who, the, the founder of Under Armour, who owns Sagamore Spirit through Plank Industries and is heavily invested in the Port Covington neighborhood. I want to bring in Scooter Monroe from Weller Development right now. Scooter, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, how are you? Fine, how are you? And thank you for uh, getting up early to join us this morning. You are part of the group responsible for developing this entire neighborhood. Uh, first of all, tell me what the overall goal is for Port Covington and where you brought it from. Because as we were talking with Brian at the start of the webcast an hour or so ago, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have come down here on a Saturday morning for anything, would you? Yeah, you know, Port Covington was a place that, you know, there, there was really no reason to to go to Port Covington. There was not much down there. There's There used to be a Sam's Club and a Walmart where people came and, you know, they did some shopping. But other than that, there, there wasn't much going on in Port Covington. Um, and, you know, Kevin Plank and, and, and the the Plank family had had a vision for the site um, to, to kind of bring it back to life. And you know, we, we really saw it as an opportunity to, you know, rebrand Baltimore. Um, you know, Port Covington uh, has, has a, ha had a big vision, and it's about, you know, a rising tide in the city of Baltimore, um, and how do we create a project that has a big impact on the city and the region. Um, and that's been the goal from day one, and, and the Stagamore Spirit Distillery um, is, is a, a fantastic way to start, right? You have, have this great, really authentic um, whiskey distillery, um, you have visitors coming through. You can come and taste the, you know, the spirit of, of Baltimore and the spirit of Maryland. Um, we, we developed a restaurant next door uh, with Andy Carmelini and the NoHo Hospitality Group um, out of New York. And, you know, that's been a tremendous success as well, where, you know, folks can, can actually enjoy the whiskey and pair it with a, with a great meal. So, um, you know, Fort Covington is, is just getting started and we're excited uh, for the next chapter when we when we start construction. You've already done some things here. There's an Under Armour office campus here, the restaurant that you mentioned, uh, some other projects. Give us a sense of uh, what's here now besides the distillery and then what will be here in the coming years? Because uh, as we mentioned, this is area. this area has always been, or since Interstate 95 was built, this really cut Port Covington off from the rest of the city and the growth we've seen in neighborhoods like Fells Point and the Inner Harbor. Sure, yep. So, you know, Port Covington being right off of, of I-95, it, you know, it is, um, you know, adjacent to the city. And like you said, it, it's a little bit, for, for years, it's been disconnected because there was no reason to, to come over here. And, and our goal is to kind of integrate, um, you know, Port Covington and make it more connected to, to the rest of the city. And, and just and make a, a vibrant development where people want to come. Um, you know, currently there, there's a few, you know, things that are going on in, in Port Covington. You mentioned Under Armour um, has an office uh, an office building over there, which we used to be the Sam's Club that they renovated. Uh, we have Nick's Fish House, uh, which is a great little waterfront restaurant. It has um, a marina there. 
and it's a great place to to relax. It has that that beach island vibe, which which we all love. If you you know interested in in having a Corona and sitting on the waterfront or a glass of whiskey, um, and then you know we have the distillery and and uh, and 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 Rye Street Tavern. Um, there's also the Baltimore Sun has its headquarters at, at Port Covington, um, so there you know there's an office you know component that that's there, and you know, in the future, our vision is we can build up to 14 million square feet on on the on the peninsula. Um, we're getting ready to start our first chapter, so that's that's um, that's three million square feet of mixed use development. Um, we're going to have office product, retail, restaurants. Um, it's going to be a really kind of well designed, vibrant community um, for folks to to come down. They can live, work, play kind of a, you know, a cliche, cliche term, but that, that's what we're building. And housing too, right? Yes. Yep. So we'll have, um, in our first, uh, in our first, you know, chapter, we'll have about 500 units of, of residential, um, that we're going to build straight, straight away, right off the bat. Um, 20% of those, uh, apartments will be affordable. Um, so, you know, Port Covington is going to have something for, for everyone um, across the income scale. We want this to be a community um, that that represents all of Baltimore. And um, that's really important. And, and the community impact, I will mention, um, is really important piece to, to this project. Um, we have uh, created a partnership with um, the communities that surround um, Port Covington. Um, many of those communities have, have, you know, have, there's, there's been disinvestment across those communities, um, for, for many years. And our goal is to, um, help, you know, put resources, um, and, and, uh, and capital into those communities to help them grow, um, and become vibrant. That's been an issue with Baltimore for many years, um. Uh... A lot of people, when they think of Baltimore, think of shows like The Wire, and sure. uh, they think of the unrest after the Freddie Gray shooting a couple of years ago. How does development like this help revive a community and bring it back into the 21st century without uh, raising the specter of gentrification because we know that there are some folks who don't like gentrification how sure. do you how do you handle that and balance it to to meet those community needs sure so um you know poor covington is is very unique because the, you know there really wasn't much going on in poor covington right so as we're as we're building this you know really new section of the city um, there's no displacement. There's no tearing down of buildings. There's no, you know, real gentrification. It's about, you know, taking something that was that was raw, vacant land that really wasn't doing anything and, and bringing it to life, right? Um, so, you know, I, I think I think the the real estate development um, industry uh, has a responsibility, right, to to help um, to help communities. Um, grow and prosper. Really, that's what that's what this business is, is all about, right? So um, that's why it's been very important to us to you know from the very beginning to partner with with the community and make sure that you know their input is heard. We're working, um, you know, as as true partners, sitting you know next to each other at the table and making decisions um, about about you know the future of, of this city because at the end of the day the the city belongs to the people this is this is a community right and people they call it charm city for a reason right because um you know once you once you come here and spend some time you start to realize that um that baltimore is more than than just you know the fire and some of the you know the stats that you hear um you know about about baltimore city um, it's really a great place, and and we're here to uh, to really enhance that. I, me I mentioned before, this is, you know, Port Covington. We see this as a as a rebranding of of Baltimore, right? And we're we're here to create jobs and opportunities um, in this city, 
and um, and and really the region. Give me a sense of what this neighborhood is going to look like five years from now. Sure, um, you're you're gonna you're gonna drive down to uh, to to Port Covington. You're gonna you're gonna be on Cromwell Street. And you'll you'll see the you'll see the distillery in the waterfront. You'll see really well designed um, buildings, you know, across the street. We've we've had a team, a fantastic team of consultants and architects and designers. And place making is very important to us. Uh, you're, you're sitting outside of the, the distillery, and you can see kind of the thought that goes into, um, you know, from the stone to the wood. To, Everything has a story and there's a reason behind um, every design decision that we make. And that's not going to change in, you know, the future phases of Port Covington. We, we want this to be an inspiring place that people come down where they can, they can live, they can work, they can have some fun. And it's about, you know, creating, um, so for office tenants, right, we're, we're out there and we're talking to office tenants and we want this to be a place for, um, where people can recruit talent. We want this to be a place where, you know, that that crowd of, of talented workers want to uh, want to come and they say, hey, I want to go work for a company XYZ because they're located in this great waterfront community that I feel good about, you know, going to every day. How worried are you about the economic impact of uh, the coronavirus pandemic long term? Because I know that it was... Uh, it's put a lot, made a lot of people nervous about investing right now. Sure, yeah. I mean, the the coronavirus has has had an impact across across all industries, and um, commercial real estate obviously is something um, that that has felt you know some of the some of the impact there. Um, you know, we we have been moving forward um, very you know steadily throughout the the coronavirus you know pandemic. Um, it's obviously slowed things down. Uh, we are we are fortunate that um, we will deliver our buildings um, in you know Q2, Q3 of 2022. Um, so we're very encouraged that um, you know by that time the uh, you know there, there's going to be a vaccine on the street. People will have figured out their um, you know their post uh, coronavirus lifestyle. <laughs> And, and what the workplace will look like um, in, in in that time frame. So, you know, we have a little bit of runway. I think we're we're glad that you know, we don't have um, you know an office building that's, that's halfway built or just getting finished right now. Um, so, um, you know, we're we're hopeful about the future, and um, you know, hopefully the the doctors and the scientists you know figure this thing out, and and we get the country in, in a better place. That brings up an interesting point, though. You don't have an office building half finished right now, but with a lot of people working from home and a lot of companies saying that uh, they're getting used to this idea of having people working from home, is there going to be less demand for office space in the future? So, you know, we, we think that the workplace will change. Um, I think that, you know, people, the, over the years, there's been, you know, a big um you know, shift towards, uh, you know, reducing office uh, footprints and, um, you know, getting as many people um, into, a, into a smaller space, right? And um, intensifying the office space. And, and I think that, you know, that'll change a bit um, post, post coronavirus. I think people will, um, you know, think, of, think much more about social distancing. Um, I think that, you know the the nine to five punching the clock. You know in, in at nine, out at out at five. I think that that will will change a bit. I think there'll be a little bit more flexibility in folks' schedule, um, and uh, you know people may work from home a few days a week, but we don't we don't see the office space completely going away. Um, you know there are challenges with with working from home. There's a, there's some benefits, but there are challenges, and um, you know, I think that, you know, folks need to be in the office. You need to uh, sit across the table from someone and, you know, look somebody in the eyes and, and you know, and shake a hand. And uh, those, those, are, those are things that, that have happened for, for centuries. And I don't, I don't think that this, that this pandemic is going gonna, is gonna to completely change that. We're not robots. 
Well, Scooter Monroe from Weller Development, thank you for uh, getting up early on Saturday and uh, joining us from home uh, via webcam. Uh, can't wait to see how this develops over the next uh, five to 10 years because uh, this distillery really looks good, but there's a lot of vacant land around here that I know you'd like to get stuff up on. So we'll, uh, we'll keep following this project. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Thank you. And uh, once again, thanks to uh, Scooter Monroe from Weller Development. They are coordinating the Port Covington project here. Um, people started lining up literally at 4 a.m., even though the check-in didn't begin till 8 to uh, get their hands on the Penny's Proof releases this morning. And uh, it's really been kind of fun just to sort of watch. I've, during the interview with Scooter, I had somebody come through, a couple come through here with their Penny's Proof uh, bottles in hand, uh, the packaging, and uh, just big grins on their faces as they were going into the uh, visitor center and gift shop. So we are going to continue this until probably close to uh, 9, 30, 10 o'clock or so. We'll basically uh, keep watching this. Uh, we are still, we are seeing more and more people coming through the lines because uh, they're picking up their merchandise and uh, stuff that they had the chance to pre-order. Uh, the pennies proof, the red maroon long sleeve t-shirts you may have seen some folks wearing as they came through. We are waiting for our next guest to uh, come over and join us right now. And uh, Mr. Hamilton? What? Come on over. My apologies. Al Hutchinson from Visit Baltimore is coming in to uh, join us right now, and uh, we were waiting for him. Let me have you sit right here, sir. Come on in and join us. Yes, please. We're being joined right now by Al Hutchinson from uh, Visit Baltimore, and uh, thank you for uh, coming in and uh, joining us today. I wanted to... Uh, let me have you scoot in just a little bit here, just because the cameras are sort of fixed and I'm not. <laughs> no worries. Tell me what, uh, tell me what having this distillery here has done to uh, help with tourism in Baltimore. I know before coronavirus, it was bringing the last couple of years. It brought a lot of folks to uh, Baltimore to visit, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, Sagamore Spirit has just extended the brand story of Baltimore. It's been uh, just a gem, you know. Uh, added addition to our storytelling. Um, we've actually partnered with Sagamore Spirit and taken their guys on the road with us uh, nationally as we go to national trade shows in Chicago, Las Vegas, telling the Baltimore story. And uh, we'll have them sampling some of our spirits. And uh, surprisingly, a lot of folks didn't know rye whiskey. We, this is where it started here in Maryland. So it really gets to your attention. So it's, it's really been a great part of our brand story. We want to continue to partner uh, with the Sagamore Spirit folks, and uh, we, we think it's a, a great story. It's a great amenity here in Baltimore, and it uh, it really helps us to broaden the storytelling of what we're all about. It's not the only distillery in town, but it's the biggest one, right? It's the biggest one, and uh, it's part of our Baltimore history. And, um, you know, spirits is just a, a growing phenomenon around the country. And I think when travelers, they really want to know about the special components to a city. What's different? What makes you sort of special? And there's no doubt that the Sagamore Spirit story um, really adds to what Baltimore has to offer to visitors as well as to our local residents. You're going to kill me for this one, but we have a few smart Alex that <laughs> take part in these webcasts. One of them, Crumpler, I like Sagamore Spirit, but I'll never forgive Baltimore for killing Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> you guys have to deal with that all the time, don't yeah, you? Yeah, we do. You know, it's, it's part of the story, but it, it's all good. We, we, we take it uh, tongue in cheek and keep moving. But look, Baltimore has so many great stories to tell, and, and the, the, the whiskey stories are part of our history, and we want to help to, to sell that, promote it. And uh, again, it's, it's really a part of Americana right now. Folks really want to know about that history. Let's talk about that history. Maryland rye was almost as legendary as Pennsylvania rye Absolutely. back in the day, and rye whiskey was really the first spirit distilled here. The first, other than rum, was really the first main uh, American spirit made here, and it was made Baltimore dominated distilling for a long time here between Baltimore and Philadelphia, right? Absolutely. And that history is coming back and, and people want to know about that history. So as a destination marketing organization like Visit Baltimore, we're, we're loving the fact that Sacramento Spirit is here. The distillery is here. People want to know about it. We bring folks here to really go through the tasting um, of, the, of the spirits. And so that history is a big part of what we're telling and promoting around the country. So we love it. 
I was talking before you came over, you came over with uh, Scooter Monroe from Weller Development, and they're building this whole Port Covington project out. How important is this project and this development to uh, making Baltimore an even better place to visit? It's, it's a huge component to where we're going to be going in the future. Obviously, we're going to get on the other side of, of the pandemic, uh, hopefully really soon, but we need this project. Um, folks are looking for authentic offerings and communities and what, what Covington has to offer and what the team with Scooter and, and the whole team is going to be doing. It's going to be special. We're going to be selling it, and, and people want to come to Anna Harbor is special, no doubt about it, but this is another great part of the Baltimore story, and so we're, we're excited about where we're going, the future of Port Covington, and uh, we, we couldn't be more uh, excited about what we're looking for. How do you uh, market the city when the image, and I addressed this with Scooter, the image that most people in, for lack of a better term, fly over land or in the rest of the world, when they think of Baltimore, they think of shows like The Wire. They think of the Freddie Gray unrest from several years ago. And they see Baltimore as a gritty place that, uh, and they're trying to figure out, well, yeah, there's Fort McHenry, there's Camden Yards, Oriole Park, maybe the Orioles if you want to see baseball or watching the Ravens. How do you convince people that there's more to Baltimore? Well, it all starts with the story. And uh, we, as an organization, we just put together a new rebrand of Baltimore. And we really did a deep dive into celebrating the genius of the city. And the genius of the city are the folks who contribute, the Baltimoreans who are writers, who are poets, uh, who really do great work, the, the small business owners. So our new storytelling with our brand is to really showcase those influencers, showcase those entrepreneurs, their faces, their voices are part of this new brand message. And what we really have to do is now take that. We wrote it out a, a couple months ago to rave reviews because now folks see themselves in the Baltimore story. And we need to take that across the country because one of the things we hear from visitors all the time is once they get to Baltimore, it's like, wow, I had no idea. And so it's all about the messaging. It's about the story. And we're going to make sure we're telling this new authentic Baltimore story that includes Port Covington, that includes Sagamore Whiskey, that needs, in addition to Fort McHenry and all the great things we know, but there is a new story of the Baltimore, but it's all about the people. And we need to be promoting that because it's a lot of goodness here. And uh, I think far too often we have not celebrated the gems in Baltimore. And that's what we want to do. Give us some of those other gems. What's What are your favorite places to go visit in Baltimore? Where do you like to go to? Well, I, I live in the city. I live right here in Locust Point. So I, I love the cool neighborhoods. Each neighborhood, whether it's Fells Point, whether it's Fed Hill, whether it's Hamden, Remington, we have so many great neighborhoods that all have a distinct flavor, a distinct vibe. And um, I think that's what makes Baltimore a really special, special city to get out and really check out those neighborhoods. So I go all over because I, I love the distinct nature of the neighborhood feel. And I think that's what Baltimore is, is all about. I know I stayed at the uh, Sagamore Pendry last night in Fells Point and was walking around the neighborhood. And even with social distancing, even with the pandemic, there was live music, there were street musicians, there were people sitting out eating, uh, the, the bars, the restaurants, good food scene that a lot of people don't realize exists here in Baltimore. It's, uh, for lack of a better term, it's sort of seen outside of this area as Washington's little brother. Right. And yeah. I, I know you hate that idea. But, yeah, no uh, doubt. Well, you know, and that's part of where we want to tell a better story about Baltimore. Uh, you know, pound for pound, we do have one of the best culinary scenes in the, in the country. We have great arts and history. So the museums you can go to, most are free. So folks can go to some great museums uh, here in Baltimore from the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Walters Museum, the, the Lewis Museum, all great story, Black Wax, uh, great Blacks and Wax Museum. So there's a lot of stories here. The National Aquarium really was so helpful to us when they first came on the market. So if you combine all those stories from the history, the museums, the medical scene here with Hopkins and University of Maryland Medical, we're the medical capital here. This is the Mecca. Of, of medical. We need to tell that as a part of our story as well. And there's a lot of diversity here as well. It's no question. I mean, this is a, you know, the reality, this is a 60 plus percent African-American city. 
and we need to celebrate those contributions. And that's going to be a part of our new new uh, messaging. But it's we're rich in diversity, not just in, in racial diversity, but, but gender, faith uh, diversity. All of that's Baltimore, and we should be happy about it. And let's let's fall in love with that again. And that's our message. We want our residents to fall in love with the city. We want the region to fall in love with the city. And we want outside visitors to come see us. Tell me about, first of all, the diversity. Uh, what's there to learn for people who are visiting here about the African-American history? Let's start there and work our way through the uh, through other groups. I mean, because you, you really talk about this rich texture that Baltimore has. Absolutely. But with a majority African-American population, there's got to be places here where people can learn about that history. It's no question. You know, Frederick Douglass spent a lot of his early life here in Baltimore. And so you can come and celebrate that and see some of those contributions. This is we we're right on the water here. And and that's part of the story that Frederick Douglass was was, was talking about. Harry Tubman came through this area uh, with the Underground Railroad. And there's history there to learn. The Lewis Museum really spends a lot of time talking about the great contributions of African-Americans to this country. And I would definitely welcome your listeners to they come to Baltimore. The Lewis Museum is a must see. It's right downtown. Um, the Great Blacks and Wax Museum, which is in East Baltimore, is another great uh, venue for folks to really learn about that history and the contributions of African-Americans. I think it's really, really important for folks to really know that Baltimoreans who've made a, a great contributions to this country. Um, sometimes we don't get a lot of that in our school systems, unfortunately. But uh, in Baltimore, we, we want to showcase that. We want to let people go to our neighborhoods, uh, go to to really get that that background of the contributions of great, great Americans. And part of that goes back to the distilling industry. I mean, we don't talk about it as often as we need to and as often as we should, but back in the pre-Civil War days, a lot of the whiskey that was being made here in Baltimore was being made by enslaved African-Americans. Uh, there's apparently, some of the records indicate that the legendary nearest green came from Maryland Absolutely. and then went to uh, Tennessee yeah, yeah. and learned how to distill here in Maryland. And there's got to be some way to start telling some of that story here as well, because if you've got the whiskey heritage, you can't tell that story of the whiskey heritage without uh, talking about the African-American heritage that went along with it, right? I think you're absolutely right. You know, this whole cultural tourism that's really uh, skyrocketed the last few years, you're always looking for another part of that story. And the, the, the spirit industry um, is something we want to incorporate into that storytelling. People are going to come from, once we reopen international visitation, I think a lot of our international visitors are going to want to know that story. And in fact, uh, pre pandemic, how international visitors, they want to come in and really know about this story. So we want to include that moving forward. And we think that the historical perspective of it, who contributed to it is something that we want to highlight and definitely uh, showcase. Well, we've been having fun with uh, people literally all over the world watching this webcast from the UK, um, all over the country, here in the States and everything. And uh, Al, I want to thank you for uh, coming over this morning because I know you didn't have to be here, but I, I really do appreciate your time coming over this morning because uh, Baltimore really is a fun city. And I know I live just outside of Philadelphia, so I get to come through Baltimore a lot. And I really, it's a place I need to spend more time. It's I've spent some time in the Inner Harbor with the family at the aquarium and stuff, but uh, there's so much more to do here. Yeah, I would just say to your listeners and your viewers to come see Baltimore. It's one of the most special cities in America, and it really contributed to making America a great place. So come see us if you're a history buff, if you're a spirit whiskey buff, if you're a museum person, if you like the waterfront, and definitely if you like crabs and others, great seafood, come see us. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you for joining us, Al Hutchinson from Visit Baltimore, Baltimore.org. Uh, what can people find at the website? They can find culinary. They can find where to go for museums. They can find the richness of all of our neighborhoods. So definitely go to Baltimore.org. It has great information, easy to navigate website. And we have uh, Tor Christensen just coming in saying, greeting, cheers from Arctic Norway. So that's <laughs> another country represented this morning. Thank you, Tor. And thank you, Al, for uh, coming in this morning and uh, joining us. So we're about to wrap things up here, I think, uh, because we've done an hour and a half or so. People are in line still. People are circulating through and uh, getting their whiskeys. And uh, it has been a fun morning. It has been a long morning. Got here about 6 a.m., a little around, just a few minutes after 6 a.m., and there were already uh, 
hundreds of people in line. And uh, they are circulating through now, getting that pennies proof uh, for a penny. And uh, I have a little bit left in my glass here. So after a 90-minute webcast this morning, we're going to say goodbye for now. Uh, we will have uh, a little bit from this on WhiskeyCast this, later this weekend on the weekly podcast. If you uh, missed last night's webcast with Colin Scott from Chivas Brothers, the uh, longtime master blender from Chivas Brothers, who has now moved on to the last drop distillers, that's available to catch on our YouTube channel. And uh, this will be available later. If you came in in the middle, you can watch the entire replay later on. Thank you again for joining us. And uh, it has been, once again, a great day. We really appreciate all the support. Everybody that uh, Sagamore Spirit, uh, all of the teammates here that made it possible for this to happen. Uh, from hooking up internet connections for us on short notice last night so we could have a high-speed internet connection to uh, helping me run power cables and uh, making everything happen. Uh, you can see in some of these camera shots, there's cables all over the place here. We, uh, we basically made spaghetti on the uh, shore of the Patuxent River this morning. So until we meet again, thanks to everybody at Sagamore Spirit, a whiskey cast sponsor and uh, that's one of the reasons we were down here this morning is, yes, they are a whiskey cast sponsor, but the Penny's Proof story is really good, too. And uh, now that we've proven we can do this, maybe we may do a few more of these live webcasts on the road in the near future. Until we meet again, I'm Mark Gillespie, live at Sagamore Spirit in Baltimore. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Wear your masks, folks, and take care of each other. For those of you in the U.S., have a great Thanksgiving, and we'll see you on the webcast this coming Friday night. Take care, everyone, and so long.